Welcome to the Tell Me More About podcast. I'm here with Wit. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Really good. Good. How are you? Uh, really good. good. Yeah. Better now that we have power. Yeah. So crazy I'm feeling, week. I know. Last week was crazy. It was. Um, but this How week. How long were you guys without power? Um, till Wednesday night. Yeah. So. We went Thursday night. Yeah. But it was still, it was just uncomfortable. Lost all the food did in you, our fridge. Yeah. That's no fun. That was yeah. miserable. We, uh, did you have another place to go or did you? We did. Okay. We good. did. We spent the night at some friend's house. Yeah. And then, yeah, just. Yeah. Nice people who are willing to take in a family of four and a dog. Did, you know? did, were you so you and you you lost your food? We were able to go to um, my dad has a place kind of north of town. We have like a retreat center kind of thing, and we were able to go out there and stay. And they had some freezer and refrigerator space. We were able to save some, oh, not okay. all. That's nice. No fun yeah. to come back home to a freezer and refrigerator full of yeah um, rotten, gross food. And not to mention, so you're you have no power yeah. till Thursday night, mm-hmm. and you're writing a sermon. Mm-hmm. So that was hard. That was it was hard, and it because it cut into it cut into um, Thursday ended up being so. Normally, I write my sermons on Wednesdays and Thursdays, like the mornings mm-hmm. uh, is when I spend my time doing that, and then in the Friday if necessary, and then definitely Saturday I'm back at it again, just knowing that I'm going to speak that night. I have a certain kind of window to get my notes, which are. <laughs> somewhat minimal, increasingly minimal these days to uh, uh, our production manager who then, you know, turns them into slides, all the verses, all the stuff. And uh, yeah, so um, those are my times to work on. I spent all day or all morning and into the afternoon on Wednesday really working on it. And then Thursday, it just stuff was happening and I wasn't able to. And then Friday, we were moving back the town, you know, into our house from mm-hmm. about an hour away, and mm-hmm. then Saturday is. I mean, I mean, it's yeah, and I had a and I was speaking at a conference on on Friday, and then yeah, it just it was a yeah. strange week. It's funny when things throw off my my rhythm. It's it's just different. Yeah, I, I, it's hard. It's hard not to feel it like in the weekend for probably. sure, for yeah. sure. So Saturday night was was fine. I, I mean, I don't know. I, it's, I was telling uh, a friend after Saturday night service, he was helping me. He was giving me some good feedback, and I really appreciated it. And I was like, thank you. Um, was so, that's so helpful because I, I feel like as the when you're preaching, I think you have the least accurate perspective of what's going on in the room hmm. because you're carrying – all of the feelings, but also, uh, you know, all of the things that you thought about saying, uh, the ways in your mind that you wished you were, you know, maybe you had planned to say something or or that you feel like you could set, could have said it better mm-hmm. that no one else has or is carrying. And so you're, you're living with all this like comparison inside yourself mm-hmm. of what it, how it went, what it sounded like, what you had intended to say, what you never had intended to say. And that, that came out that did happen. <laughs> and ironically on a week on words, but um, yeah, you know, it was, um, and so, so, so I feel like it's helpful Sometimes I have someone say, "Hey, here's what was going on," or "Here, man, man, that that came across like this," and I was just like, "Thank you, hmm. that's so helpful." Uh, it gave me kind of the perspective I I needed, especially going into Sunday. Sometimes you know, sermons are a bit like a child. You don't know you, you like right. You're getting to know them like like when hmm. you're when you're you know when you have a new you know you have a we have five kids, and with each one, it's like, who who are you going to be? Mm-hmm. What's your personality going to be like? And as they get a little older, and you you start to know them more, you realize, okay, like my my youngest daughter B is very introverted, and my uh, daughter Zuzu, who's just a little older than her, is is very very extroverted, and they're really different. And you can, and you could kind of you could see that at like two and three, it starts to. Anyways, s- s- sermons work <laughs> a little bit like that, like. You're not sure you're, you're you're in some sense creatively giving birth to this thing, and then and then you're sort of getting to know it at the same time. And usually by like the third time I've preached it, I'm like, okay, I kind of know who you are, like what what you're like, and how I should, what kind of sermon this is. So like to be able to on Sunday, I was able to kind of slap that warning label on the beginning and mm-hmm. say, hey, this is going to be a harder sermon. Um, I didn't think about that going into Saturday night. It didn't occur to me quite the same way that I knew it would be on Sunday just because I yeah, I had some feedback. And anyways, 
um, yeah, but also kind of understood what it was after preaching it one time, you sort of know, okay, that's, that's, that's what this is about. Yeah. Um, so you already mentioned this, but it was a sermon on words because mm-hmm. Proverbs has a lot to say about the words that we speak and how we speak them. Yeah. Um, and so the content was broken up into these three sections, mm-hmm. um, when to speak, how to speak, and what to speak. Mm-hmm. I remembered that. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so I thought that it, yes, I would agree. I was there on Saturday night, mm. and as I was listening to you, I realized that there's no one that's going to be exempt from kind of being hit by mm, this in right, some wow. form yeah, yeah, yeah. or fashion. Yeah. <laughs> um, you might be good in like 85% of it, but mm-hmm. then there might be that 15% that you're like, Okay, yeah, I yeah. could do better here. Yeah, for sure. Um, in fact, me and some friends, we went out, me and my husband went out to dinner afterwards with another couple, and as we were sitting there eating, um, we just went around and talked about the part, like, mm. what part of this hit you the most? Where, When you were sitting in the room, you're like, okay, I could probably do better here. And mm. um, I would have to say for me and... Uh, one other person at the table, it was like, sometimes we just start talking <laughs> and we should definitely stop and we just keep going. And well, so, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So if we're thinking about the when to speak, you talked about the babbling fool mm-hmm. and you talked about moments where you should speak up and okay. you're tempted to stay silent. Mm-hmm. Would you say you struggle with one of those more than the other? Uh, yes, both. <laughs> <laughs> I speak more than I should. Yeah, and I know that uh, I'm the I'm the one that that you know like like when when we go out to dinner, uh, uh, you know the common question that I have for Heather afterwards is, did I talk too much? And the answer is, is uh, you know somewhat frequently yes. Yeah, you know you said more than you should, or or you just dominated the conversation. Just mm-hmm. you know back up and let other people talk. I like to talk with you know with friends. I, I love a good conversation and yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a problem for me. Is is is, and I'm not a good listener either. That's the other thing is I can be a, I can really be a poor listener. So because I like my I like my opinion, I really do. <laughs> so like I said, yeah. so much of what I was preaching this weekend was really was just like okay, I'm not very good at this. I mean, yeah. I, it was rather ironic that I'm the one that gets to deliver this when I'm not good at it. Um, but it, it yeah, so I like. This, you know, I like my opinion and I talk more than I should. What are you thinking? I'm wondering, like, what do you think the benefit would be of, mm. like, if you changed that, if you were intentionally, yeah. if you intentionally talked less mm-hmm. walking into those situations, what do you think would get better? Yeah, I mean, I, I would understand people, I think, more. Um, I think sometimes I, I know sometimes, uh, you know, I assume, I, I think one, one, one place where I cross a line kind of with my words is is just I can speculate a mm. lot on what's happening or why things are happening in areas that I, I'm, I'm wading into things that I, I don't really know the answers to, but mm-hmm. I but I like to think that I do. It's probably a little bit of a God complex. And I, I mean, a lot of us a lot of us have it. I'm, I'm, I think all of us have it to some degree, depending on it expresses itself in different ways. But uh, but yeah, I I I've I've you know come up with reasons why people have done things to me or or ignored me or didn't respond and then found out later that it was nothing to do with what I you know assumed that it was and I so yeah it, I I would do better just to to back up and and kind of leave those things yeah trust them to the Lord or mm-hmm. go and sit down and have a have a conversation with with mm-hmm. someone um so yeah I don't know I I I think I'd do less of that um yeah. yeah, Pete Scazzaro calls that mind reading mm-hmm. or not mind reading. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm a horrible mind reader. I do it all the time. Yeah, I know why you're saying. I assign motive. Yeah, uh, that's a bad one in arguments. Assigning motive to you, yeah. you know, you do this. This is what you're, you know, it's mm-hmm. coming from this place, and I find yeah. out that's not true at all. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and the person less that, arguments that'd be a that'd there, be a, there would be less <laughs> arguments, and it, depending on the person that you're talking to, if they're if they're confident enough and and they understand who they are enough, they can push back on that and say, "Oh, actually, I'm sorry, that's not what was going through my right. mind." Right. Well, that and Heather does that pretty regularly. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I try to guess. She yeah. hates it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm working on it. I, I can imagine. I can <laughs> that would be that would be really frustrating. But at the same time, there's this. This, there is this point where, yes, if somebody were saying something to you that was wrong, or if you were in a situation where you're thinking, I really do need to speak up about this and not let it slide by and mm-hmm. actually say something, um, that's actually a really good thing to do. I used to be really, really bad at that, mm. and I've, and it's an area that I've grown in. Talk about it. Quite so, what do you mean, like, like, like with friends, yeah, with family, or with or, people? So, I, I find that I'm not. I'm, I'm great with. I can confront things with people that I know pretty easily. Yeah, that's not hard. With people that I don't know, I am not good at. Like, if I get horrible service at a restaurant, I'm just going to tip you the exact same that I would everyone else, just because I don't want to create. Uh, like you know, any 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 um a, a scene. Uh, if my neighbor w- was was continually dumping their trash on my lawn, I would just pick it up mm-hmm. and just deal with it. Mm-hmm. I, I would, uh, you know, if their dog was coming over <laughs> you, and your neighbor, yeah. you wouldn't go to your neighbor it's and hard say, for me. "Stop dumping." I mean, I probably <laughs> if you did it like if you're, they were like running over there just dumping their trash <laughs> on my lawn, but like if their trash is blowing over there, it would yeah. be hard for me to just, yeah. Um, if they had their dog out and dog mm-hmm. was con- you know continually pooping in my yard, it'd be very hard for me to go over and say, "Hey, c- please don't let your dog do this." Yeah. Um, just watch um, him from outside the window. Yeah, just stand, just stand in there. Window. That's more more of what I would do. <laughs> yeah. Would be something like that. Just a, like a like how can I subtly show you disapproval without having to come over? I I don't yeah. like I don't mm-hmm. like confrontation with people that I. People that I don't know, but with people I know, it's easy. I don't know why that is, hmm. but I just don't. So I think it's because confrontation with people that you're close to it actually deepens the relationship that hmm. you have. Maybe, yeah. And so when that's you, for sure true. But yeah, yeah maybe that's why. I yeah, when you're able to go through conflict with a person, there's joy on the other side of that because of the rest- whatever whatever fracture there was in the relationship, it's been restored. Hmm. And so yeah, you get that deepening of relationship. When I was in so for me, I think it's people who I respect or mm. honor or people in authority. I have a I I did have a really hard time mm. bringing things up, like saying this this isn't right, or mm-hmm. can we talk about this a little mm-hmm. bit more? And um, mm-hmm. I realized that it was almost a uh, like a victim or a martyr mentality in me, oh, wow. where I would just let it kind of slide by and think, you know what, the Lord will take care of that in the long run. Um, How did it make you a martyr? How did that happen or like a victim? um, Because sometimes there were situations I was in where I was, I would be maybe mistreated Mm -hmm. um, by someone in leadership or... But how did you handle like the the emotions of all of that? Did you, was there a sort of, was there some kind of self-soothing that happened or Mm -hmm. a treasuring uh, in some sense of the pain uh, Um, that made you more noble? Yes. Uh, I mean, I would... When you talk about a martyr, that's what I think of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would think of it as like, the Lord sees mm-hmm. what I'm going through. <laughs> the Lord sees what I'm going through. Look at and, how you I know, suffer for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I don't. I'm just gonna like whatever that was. I'm just gonna let it go. So there's and, a, in your so in your heart there's is there like a subtle pride that's going mm, on? Yeah. Oh, for sure. And this, yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, and this, you're not neglecting to do the thing that you. So, so it's really an mm-hmm. avoidance, and then and then taking that avoidance of responsibility and agency mm-hmm. which we talked mm-hmm. about last week mm-hmm. I'm avoiding responsibility and I'm but I'm also kind of uh, I'm proud about it so yeah. there's a certain yeah like yeah. Uh, boy the subtlety uh, of the it's, human heart right oh man <laughs> it's so subtle and I've and I realized hmm. like even this past week I was in a situation where I handled I handled something differently mm-hmm. and I didn't do that thing where I could have said, you know, it's yeah. it's okay. Yeah. I'm just going to let it go. Right. The Lord sees um mm-hmm. and and yeah, there's an opportunity to have have a mature conversation that yes. uh that I yeah, I saw what, the talk gross. about a mature conversation. What does that look like? What do you um, mean by mature conversation? I would say this, like there's the okay. 
So there's the valuing of the relationship that happens. Mm. And then there's the holding mm. holding that relationship and and maybe your sadness or mm-hmm. whatever that might be along with it. Mm. And so not denying what you're maybe feeling in the moment, right. but not allowing that to be coming to become bigger than okay. than the relationship. Interesting. So yeah. And there's just harder for some folks to separate those two things, I think, than it, others. It right? absolutely is, yeah. yeah. Um, especially hmm. if you have fear around those things, hmm. or if you have fear of what would happen. Yeah, fear of uh, rejection, fear hmm. of uh, fracturing the that relationship beyond repair, um, what hmm. that other person might think of you. And hmm. so you talked about this a little bit. You talked about integrity this yeah. weekend, and yeah. I think. I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah, it does. Um, and I, yeah, there's there's some people who will say one thing to you, but internally they're thinking something completely different. Yeah. Or um, and you and I think a lot of times if you're a little bit like if you're aware, you can feel that from them, mm. from their body language, or because what is it? Is it ninety percent? Or maybe it's not that yeah. much, but it's a, I've heard this number: eighty to ninety percent of communication is nonverbal. Yeah, so mm-hmm. you might be saying specific words, but your tone, your body language, mm-hmm. the way that you're engaging with a person um, is saying a whole lot more. Mm. And so, yeah, talk about that a little bit. What um, when I don't know? You talked about the disintegration that happens, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you said that, I actually thought of like. If there, were, if a person like had an interior pane of glass, like if they, mm. or if they were a mirror, maybe, and every time they said something out of their mouth that were untrue, like based on the way they were like feeling on the inside, I just saw like a crack. Wow! And over time, that all becomes so cracked and fractured that you're just not seeing things clearly mm. anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, I think that's a good way to think about it. So the idea is that integration or integrity is, and, and, and the word integration, which you can see is, is uh, they're, they're related to each other. The, the idea is wholeness, to be unified. Um, yeah, and to not be divided. Um, mm-hmm. That's the idea of integrity. The opposite of that would be to be broken apart. And the word that, that comes to my mind is disintegration, which mm-hmm. is the idea of dissolving or breaking something into pieces. So when we speak, when our mouths and our hearts match, there's an integrity uh, to, to, to our soul, I think, just internal integrity. Um, this is why, you know, I don't know, for me, and I'm not saying, you know, uh, this is not like a humble brag, like I'm, I'm just such a person of integrity, I, I really struggle to lie. I hate lies. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a justice issue for me, though there is some of that in in there, no doubt. Uh, you know the the injustice of lies, but even just for me, you know, it's it's well known in my family. Like I cannot I cannot lie. I cannot keep, tell like I can't keep a secret. If my kids press me on things that I'm supposed to sort of keep hidden, I'll just I fold like a house of cards. I can't do it. I don't like. Uh, the duplicity of having one truth in the inside of me and another truth I'm representing to you through my words and my, you know, my actions. It just drives me crazy. So some of the worst kind of movies for me to watch are movies where someone's holding onto a secret for like the entire mm. time, you know, if there's an affair or there's mm-hmm. some, it's just, it's the worst. I, I just, all I want to do is just shake that character and say, just go tell somebody. Just yeah. say, say something. Tell the truth. Yeah. Um, because I can't imagine what it must be like to live with that kind of that kind of I don't know duplicity on the inside of you. That fracturing of your soul um, is just it, it, yeah. It's, it's got to be awful um, mm-hmm. for me. I I just can't take it. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's the idea of integrity. Is that is that what I'm what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking? And it, it, it isn't the idea that I've got to say every thought that comes through my mind, but it does it does mean that when I'm going to represent myself or speak to you, I'm going to speak uh, with both grace and truth, right? So what I'm saying to you is going to be true, but also I'm taking you into account, which is the idea of grace. And so those two things need to need to happen and balance together. And we could we could talk about that more if if, if that's worth diving into, but. 
disintegration is the idea that I'm that I'm that I'm representing one thing but feeling another. And this happens, it just happens all the time where we either, you know, unable to vocalize what we're feeling. And so maybe we're just used to kind of putting putting forward a sort of I'm okay, mm. everything's fine mm -hmm. kind of attitude. Um, maybe it's maybe it's hidden under the sort of cynicism of nothing's going to change anyway if I tell you whatever. So mm -hmm. why should I share this with you? And all that gets kind of buried under a everything's fine <laughs> attitude. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then the, I think the worst of it is that the 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 the, the real um, maybe I might say you know intentional um, manipulation where. I'm I'm intentionally misrepresenting what I'm feeling toward you when secretly I feel like this. You know, I'm I'm very aware of it. Um and, and I, I I none of that can be good for you. I mean, none of that. I just can't imagine psychologically, uh, emotionally mm -hmm. any of that can be health healthy. That you're gotta be really destroying yourself on the in, from the inside out. And maybe maybe like in your case, it's it's an it's a failure to honor your own voice. Mm. Um, it's a failure to value your own autonomy, agency, perspective. Um, it's how you know. It's it's what we talked about last week. It's the doormat syndrome, right? You're you're, yeah. you're continually used, and and you do see that with folks where it's like they get run over, and they're resentful, but it just keeps happening. And there's yeah. It, mm -hmm. We're not dealing with stuff. Mm -hmm. Lack of agency, mm -hmm. and it sounds like what you had to, to learn how to do is to is to assert some agency, start valuing your own voice a little bit, your own perspective, but to figure out how to do that in a healthy way. So, and maybe the opposite of that would be, or or maybe the the, the unhealthy way to do that is just to just to sort of wildly blurt out whatever ugly emotions are on the inside that maybe come out in uh, an, an accusatory way, yeah. maybe come out in a, you always, you never, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that kind of thing. You have to yeah. learn how to, how to bring those emotions to the surface without them going crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because, yeah, you're thinking about, for me, it was thinking about honoring God. Well, that's that. really good. And so... I how why honoring God? Um why? Well, okay, so Psalm 86:11 mm. says, "Unite my heart to fear your name and I will walk in your truth." So wow. and like I will praise you with well, my whole heart. Well, that's a great verse. Heart. Unite my heart. Unite whole my heart. heart. Wow. So there's this like idea mm -hmm. the about idea of integration. You need to have like you can't be part of you over here and part of you over here. You have to bring your whole self under God, and um, wow. I mean, Proverbs has a lot to say about the fear of the Lord, like mm. how there's this idea of, if, of you not being able to um, be a duplicitous person if you want to fear Him, if you mm. want to walk in truth. Yeah. Um, and so I don't. I think that um, when I was younger, I understood that in in some ways, but still didn't didn't know there was some. There was probably some pain that was following me around, and mm -hmm. that um, was causing me to respond in specific ways. And now, um, I think, yeah, after going through a journey of healing and allowing myself, so with all relationships, there's risk. I mean, there's like you think that there's risk, and um, well, there certainly is risk. Yeah. I would think. And and but what we don't realize is that we because we know that intuitively with people, we also feel that with God mm. in certain ways. Mm. And so <clears throat> being seen and known by him for like in a completely integrated way, like not yeah. leaving anything kind yeah. of hidden. Yeah. Um Mm. Is it feels feels like a safe way to go, but when we bring all of ourselves to God before mm. Him, um, He's able to heal us, and then we're able to show up as whole people in mm -hmm. front of others too. Mm -hmm. And that and there's still that kind of risk that you feel, um, but you know, like it's worth it mm. um, because we were made for a relationship.
a lot of what we're talking about this week with words and being honest with your words isn't going to happen until you until you know who you are is what mm-hmm. we were talking about last week with identity mm-hmm. through submission. It, it is, I mean, identity being such a key piece and Proverbs being framed right from the beginning through the language of sonship, family, mm. uh, belonging. Mm-hmm. You're, you're part of a family now. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you some things not to do or mm-hmm. some things to avoid. And if you don't get that, that family piece, that, that relational piece, oh, it's a, it'll, be, it'll be impossible mm-hmm. to to accept some of the hard things that are going to be said because yeah I mean it'll hit you right at the core level and you won't you won't know exactly what to do with it or how to respond to it and um yeah that's kind of what you're you know in order like to bring your whole self to a to a relationship you you have to have an identity that's rooted somewhere outside of that relationship mm-hmm. otherwise like I guess a good way to think of it is like if a parent let's say a mother loves her kids to such a degree, and maybe even her identity is is wrapped up in her children, she'll never really be able to let her children go. Mm. She'll never really be able to d- discipline those kids in the way that they need to be disciplined because, because she can never risk fully the relationship. She can never separate, she can never untangle herself. She'll mm-hmm. always be so tied to those kids that There'll always be some compromise, they'll, 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 and, and and that can be taken advantage of, and often is in relationships. It's like I'm, and so I'm not. If I'm not a whole person, that's the idea outside of this mm-hmm. relationship. But if I need you somehow to be a whole person, then I I, I really can't. I, I think it puts you in a really bad place to mm-hmm. really love someone because now you're loving from a place of of need. Mm-hmm. Um, and an incompleteness that doesn't really allow you to self-sacrificially love, mm-hmm. but rather it's almost like a selfish love. I have to love you. I'm loving you because I really need you. And I'm, and, and, but, but rather if I could, and th- you know, Keller was the one that really introduced me to this idea. If I could get, if I could receive love from somewhere else um, in a relationship where someone didn't need me, in the same way that I need other people, they could just love me for who I am, though they don't need me at all. Which is exactly what, you're, what we describe when we're describing a relationship with God—someone who doesn't need us at all, mm-hmm. but who loves us completely and fully. Then now I am liberated to go love others in a way that I don't—a self-sacrificial way. Mm-hmm. And this isn't to, to say I have no needs. It's just to say. Um, I don't know. It allows me to, I think, in the healthiest of ways, to separate myself from the relationship in the in the in the best way to to say to 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 have some differentiation, mm-hmm. right? Where I'm not so enmeshed from an identity perspective in the relationship that I can I can have the hard conversations because I'm not I'm not terrified of what will happen if I say the truth. Right. It's a long way of saying you had to, before God, become a whole person Mm -hmm. before you could go to the people that you feared and say, hey, this. Yeah. Because before you could never risk the potential outcome of what might happen if they reject you, if they get angry. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's probably a strong way of saying it. Yeah. But yeah. I guess so. I don't know. Yeah, so not necessarily feared as much as okay. like had a had a desire for I'm, well, fear would be a part of it, but desire to honor them and mm-hmm. yeah, just maybe a misunderstanding of what what that would be. Gotcha. Um so, hmm. yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um as you were talking, I was thinking about something you shared this weekend around the wounds of a friend. Mm. And because we're talking about relationship and and there's there's people there are people who are able to bring correction into our lives mm-hmm. that we're able to receive yeah and um yeah there's this idea of sword thrusts like mm-hmm. somebody wounding you mm-hmm. to cause you pain mm-hmm. and somebody wounding you to make space for healing mm-hmm. um what do you, hmm. and you shared a pretty personal story out of I that. Did, yeah. Can we revisit that story for a second? It was sure. about it was about Pastor Ethan. Yeah, so yeah. I, I've had a, a long standing habit since the earliest I can remember of sixth grade, and I think it's an identity issue. I know it is. 
for me that was on when I was pl- when I would play sports if I didn't perform well or if the team didn't perform well I would feel shame embarrassment it's the only way I could describe it and my way to deal with that is to deflect all of those negative feelings that I'm feeling personally I'm not that good um onto everyone else so rather than me not being good you're not good (laughs) you're Mm -hmm. terrible and if i can make it about you then i don't have to face the reality that i failed Hmm. and that happened all through my teenage years increasingly probably so into my adult years like my 20s and uh, 20 to 30 or so, I played a lot of basketball, like a lot. And some occasional, you know, we had a flag football league here at the church. But the same thing is like, depending on the game, if the stakes were high or if I really wanted to win or if I was playing against someone that I thought I was better than, I and I, and I lost, my way would be to, in, to, to, to like bring you down, to just insult you. Hmm. Um, or if I had lost in some way that I thought I, I shouldn't have, I would, you know, deflect all of that embarrassment onto the other people or whatever, you know, just my, or anger, just like make your freaking shots, bros, you know, whatever. Just, and I would do that openly. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't try to do any of those things with any decorum or, or like any, I would never pull someone aside and say, hey, you know, next time this, I just, Say it right out. I mean, to the point that that like in church league, this is how bad it would get. Um, I would play a men's basketball league, and I mean, I was very competitive. And there would be guys on my team, and they're, whatever reason, I mean, they're not basketball players. It's not what they do, but they're just not playing well, or we're getting beat by a bunch of old dudes, and I'm angry. And you know, I'm letting uh, certain people on my team hear about it to the point that they just grab their stuff and leave, hmm. just in the middle of the game, because of how I was treating them. Hmm. So it, it was bad. Um, you know, it wasn't like that every time, but there would be intense, particularly intense times. Anyways, um, so when I were playing, and, and, and Pastor Ethan's there, and I don't remember what happened um, other than, you know, some measure of me, you know, yelling at people or saying cruel things or whatever happened. And after the game or after that night's games, we play lots of games when you play pickup basketball. Um, He sent me some kind of text uh, uh, that just essentially was like for the first time he, because he he had been part of this before. I think it was probably very hard for him. It's not easy for him to, this is not his native personality, but he just came back to me and was just like, hey, the way you talk to me tonight uh, uh, is not right. And we, I mean, I was working at the church. I mean, he was too. He was a pastor here. Hmm. So, I mean, I was 30 at this time. Um, and he was just like, man, the way that this went down, you're, it, it's causing, it, it would cause people to, to not respect me, but it also causes people to not respect you. And, you know, just the long and short of it was he just asked me to stop. And I so appreciated that. I it, it dawned on me when he when when I read it, I I knew immediately. Yeah, I'm wrong. I need to. He's right, and this does need to stop. I don't remember exactly what happened. It was uncomfortable. Obviously, you could imagine, you know, just being called out like that. I didn't enjoy it, but also knowing that he was he was right and things needed to change. I don't remember I sent him a text, something like that, back thanking him. Um, but yeah, it changed my life. I mean, I determined from that point mm-hmm. forward that I'm not going to do this anymore, that things are going to change. I mean, I mean, and I was never, you know, not perfect. And it, I, I can still, you know, even like today playing Catan, uh, <laughs> like a board game, I can get competitive about it. I, yeah. I can feel all those same feelings. You know, you got lucky. Yeah. You know, all that. Like, yeah. you, you, you don't really deserve to beat me. I'm better than you. I can always maintain my superiority. It's a, it's a pride. It's ugly. It is. Yeah. And I have to, I have to, I have to apologize. I have to, <laughs> I have to work at it. Um, I have to restrain my tongue where, you know, um, but yeah. So, but it, yeah, that, that had a massive impact on me. But, but, but it happened because someone was willing to confront me 
in a way. It's interesting that the, the verse, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Mm-hmm. So the, the other verse is uh, Proverbs 17, I think it is, something about uh, sword thrusts, like uh, rash words are like sword thrusts. It's interesting mm-hmm. that there's no mention, uh, and I need to read it again, but I don't know that there's a mention of relationship. Mm-hmm. But in Proverbs 27, I think it is, 5 and 6, where it talks about faithful are the wounds of a friend. It, it It's interesting how those wounds are framed within the context of relationship. Yeah. And that's where it's not my place to go correct people who I don't know. Mm-hmm. To sit down with people I have no relationship with and say, hey, you should do this differently. That's foolish. Mm-hmm. I don't think that helps. But when you have a friendship, yeah, there's a real value in being willing to sit down and say, hey... I don't know if you realize this, but this is how this part of your personality is affecting people. It's interesting that this is something that God wanted to do in you, clearly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He wanted you to grow in this area, but mm-hmm. um, it didn't happen when you were sitting down with your Bible open uh-huh. for your quiet right. time. <laughs> it wasn't like the Holy Spirit, and and absolutely the Holy Spirit does correct us in a moment, but He... Also, we've been given people. The people mm-hmm. of God are also a oh, sorry. vehicle that God uses, oh, yeah. I mean, in a huge way to form us and to shape us into the image of Jesus. And so a lot of us want to do this like Jesus thing on our own. Mm-hmm. Oh, I wouldn't like ever want anyone to come yeah, and no correct kidding. me or, you know, just the thought of it is terrifying. So um, mm-hmm. there may be living this kind of hidden life of all everything looks good on the outside, mm. but internally um, they're scared of of what somebody might bring to their attention. But yeah, you know, yeah. having relationships, yeah, it it, it it does that. And the best thing about it is that when you know you're committed to to someone mm-hmm. over over a long time, you know, that that again, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Mm-hmm. Ethan is a friend. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd had other guys. I had. I'd had other guys. I'd had a few people stand up to me in a, in the gym before. Uh, but I didn't know him very well. And I could just dismiss what they said. And I thought, well that guy's just an you know an idiot or whatever. And but um, but but when it came from a friend, mm-hmm. someone looking at me and saying, "Hey, I care about you. This has to stop," mm-hmm. or at least as so far as it depends on, like it's, it's between you and me. I'm not going to allow you to talk that way to me. Yeah, that's what got my attention. Was like, okay, I'm now seeing through the through the eyes of someone that I know is not is not just out to get me, but they're they he cares about me. But also, this is this is hurting me, and it's hurting my relationships. And I was able to hear it. That's I think the power of friendship is you're able to hear things from friends that you might not otherwise hear from other people. We're not easily correctable, mm-hmm. and particularly outside of relationships, very hard to receive correction. You know, if it, as a pastor, occasionally. I get anonymous notes. Oh. Uh, I don't. I rarely receive them. If you write in an email, it's just you know whatever a kind of big criticism. It won't make it to me, um, which I'm thankful for. And I I don't really need that. Um, sometimes people will write on the back of an offering envelope. Hmm. Uh, uh, you know what they what they thought of some you know some comment. And every once in a while, I I come across one or whatever. I, I I'll see one somehow and. Yeah, they, they don't they don't they don't move me. You don't you don't say to yourself, "Hmm, I really need to take that to heart." It's because it's coming outside the 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 uh, outside of a relationship. Mm-hmm. I don't know you. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It, you just don't receive it the same way. Drive by criticism doesn't usually produce the fruit that I think we hope it will produce. Mm-hmm. But in the that, that that's the thing about relationship. It's it's part of why it, it's the idea. It's it's because I know that you're committed to me, even if this doesn't work out, or even if I don't change. I know you're you're in my corner, or maybe you've proven that to me over years. And so there's a different level of commitment there, and that I think leads to a different level of listening. I'll take your your counsel a bit more, mm-hmm. maybe a lot more, just because we know each other. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What would you say to a person who needs to have a hard conversation with a friend? Hmm. Yeah. I think I'd say just be willing to take the first step. Just send the text. Just just, just pray it and ask the Lord to muster up the strength to say, to just send a text that just says, hey, can we talk? Mm-hmm. 
and let him then give you the strength to show up to that you know meeting place and then let him give you the strength to to just get the first words out of your mouth you know it's like you don't you don't have to you don't have to think about it all at once just break it up into pieces lord mm. just give me the power to send the text <laughs> That's mm-hmm. it. And then I'll worry about, okay, now we gotta figure out what I'm gonna say. We'll, we'll yeah. worry about that then. Let's just let's just put you know one foot foot in front of the other or you know, one thumb in front of the other and send that text. Yeah. Um, and just begin. Yeah. Cause if we if we give ourselves enough time, we'll catastrophize anything mm-hmm. and we'll think about, okay, well, this is it. All the reasons why yeah. I'm not gonna do it. Yeah. 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 And I'd say send it before you really have much time to think to you know, think it all through. <laughs> Just get it out there. Hey, yeah. can we talk? Yeah. yeah. And if they're a friend, they'll they'll listen. Yeah. They're not gonna shut you down. Right. Um, so And then I think the second thing to do is is probably to spend some time, uh, and maybe before you send the text, you know, it just depends. Really considering what's going on inside of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say sometimes we don't need to have conversations. Mm-hmm. And it's not because it's because because the matter that we're talking about is something that I can get over by myself that yeah. I don't need to confront you with. It should be a rare thing that we're having to confront each other. Like I said in the sermon, Proverbs does have a lot to say about the glory of overlooking offenses, mm-hmm. letting things go. And I think that there's a real honor in that is just saying, you know what? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna allow myself to be offended. Moving on. I'm 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 forgetting that. Um, but sometimes things happen that just can't, I just can't get it out of my mind and I feel like I need to have a conversation with you. And when that happens, I think it's worth sitting down and, uh, Pete Scazzaro does have a, uh, a ladder of integrity mm-hmm. exercise. It's, uh, like a, a series of questions mm-hmm. that's really meant to identify what's going on inside of you and what value so you can really with clarity speak about what's happening and it may be that you come to the end of the ladder of integrity and go oh i don't need to have a conversation at all this is a me issue i need yeah. to deal with it yeah uh, it may be no i do i do need to sit down and tell them that i really value this um and and it i, I had to have a conversation with a friend i don't know a couple years ago um it just to me felt like uh, my time or my the relationship wasn't being valued to the degree that I would like to would have wanted it to be valued. And basically what it came down to is like um, when we wanted to you know spend time together, uh, there there would be uh, reasons why they couldn't. Well, I've, I scheduled this appointment or I've already got this thing. But I'm like, but we had already talked about going to lunch. Why is it that you're willing to cancel on me? to go hang out with so and so and you're got to keep your word to them but you're not telling them sorry I've, I've we've already agreed to go to lunch with Wit and Heather and I can't you know hang out with you on Friday and so and that was bothering me and so I just sat down and I was like man I've got a and there were several things it was more than more than just that so I I kind of put my I had to I spent some time with Heather just working I'm like am I am I off is this too much am I am I just being petty and we, we agreed no there's more here so we went through the ladder of integrity exercise came up with whatever value I don't even remember what it was I'm like hmm. I do value this hmm. I would prioritize the relationship and so I sat down and yeah there was an apology and I, I you know I hear you and all of that and 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 we're different the, the other the other thing is I still recognize and you know it's like we're we're different people. We 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 prioritize things differently, and we live our lives differently. And I, you have to make some space for that. Not everybody's going to do things exactly the way that you want them. But yeah, in general, it was good for me to be able to sit down and say, "This bugs me." It made our friendship stronger. So. Um James 3 mm-hmm. talks about how no human being can tame the tongue. Yeah. Um, and if no human being can tame the tongue, like you can't, I can't, mm-hmm. um, what hope do we have <laughs> of actually being able to do that? Uh, yeah, you know, that's interesting. It's it, that, That's, um, yeah, it's the bad news uh, and the good news of the gospel all right there. Mm-hmm. So the gospel is, is bad news first because... Um, yeah, I, the way I've said it for years is is the good news isn't good until the bad news is bad. In other words, you don't see yourself as hopeless, as a sinner, as not able to not able to make it on your own apart from Christ. 
um, you will you'll never really treasure him for who he is. You'll you'll mm-hmm. miss the the power and potency of of the gospel. And I think that's part of what James is getting at here is that uh, on your own you it, you are hopeless. I mean, I think I think you know all of us can grow in some measure or another, and there's things we can. But the the, the root cause of what's what's broken in humanity that ultimately downstream manifests itself through our words is is a brokenness that we can't heal hmm. and uh, a compulsion that we can't fully control. And um, and so we need we need Christ. We need His power, and that is the the, the gospel is more than just a, a set of doctrinal beliefs to adhere to, but it's a power that uh, it's the power of God present on the very on the inside of you to to, to actually change. Hmm. And that's that's in some ways inexplainable until you experience it. I, I was watching yesterday. Heather sent this to me. I haven't seen really the full thing, but I saw Greg Laurie, who is kind of part of the subject of the the Jesus Revolution movie. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a pastor out in California. But he's interviewing Alice Cooper. Oh, and apparently Alice Cooper has been like radically saved, hmm. and it's fascinating to hear. I just saw like a short clip. I didn't even hear the whole thing. We were at dinner last night, and I just pulled it up. But basically, what Alice Cooper is saying is. <clears throat> He's saying, like, the change in me and the difference of what I feel, he goes, I can't explain it to you. People ask me, it's like, what is that? And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. I don't have words to describe it. I can only tell you that I'm a a very different person. And every single person that I've known that's, like, had that, they've 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 encountered Jesus in a profound way. It, he really does change them in a way that you go, I, I it, it is it is somehow unexplainable. The best thing I can tell you is that it's a spiritual power that really does transform you from the inside out. It doesn't make all of your problems go away right. immediately. But there is a new will, a mm-hmm. new desire mm-hmm. um, on the other side of conversion that really does change like what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And I think, I mean, all of the all of the psychology around change is that sort of the white knuckling and behavior modification doesn't work. You have to change the affections. You have to change the identity. Mm-hmm. And if you don't touch those things, then the rest of it has no effect. And that is really that is the gospel. I was a sinner, now mm-hmm. I, but I died. I'm now resurrected. I'm now in Christ. I have a whole like I'm part of a new kingdom. And as such, my like all of my priorities and my desires, they, they all shift and change. And you know, not maybe not all immediately in some right. really amazing radical cases. Like I I've interviewed Isaac, uh, my buddy Isaac, and his story is incredible to this end. But it's one of those stories that you really do get to see someone like sh- like total, total personality shift almost. Same person, but different, like, like just all of the old. Um, insecurities and old desires just starting to kind of slough off of them and becoming a new person. And I, and I think that is that that's what happened for me when I talk about you know the the story of playing basketball is all of that was happening right there in my kind of real Jesus. What I would in some sense a sort of conversion. Um, and I would say that what was happening is I was gaining a new set of desires as I was realizing the grace that had been extended to toward me. And as I marveled and wondered at it, it 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 changed the way immediately started to change the way that I was thinking about other people. I started realizing how how could I how could I shame other people when I had not been shamed? How could I not extend grace toward other people when I had been given so much grace? There was and and, and so it started to change the way that I talk to people. I it just everything started to shift and change. But it, mm. it all comes down to the, to me, the power of the gospel. Um, really believing that in encountering Jesus for real, and He just changes you. Hmm. Yeah, and it changes the way you talk. Yeah, it, it does. Changes the way you use your words. It does. So yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. So it's been much. Fun. Yeah, it has. Been.